Hello, everybody. This is the, the part of the evening where, I, where you know, that you've really been looking forward to. I, I get up here and talk. I can't actually see any of you because the light's right in my face. Uh, so you can keep eating, and I can't tell. And uh, just leave me a dessert is all I ask for. So I'm Andy Burnett. I'm the executive director of the Computing Research Association, and so I'm going to take a few minutes of your time to tell you about CRA. Um, CRA has been around for 38 years. It's a nonprofit association, which means we don't make money and return it to stockholders. Um, we, our offices are in downtown Washington, D.C. We have a staff of 11 people, permanent staff, and our job is to care for the health of the computing research enterprise in North America. That's our charter. And so what does this mean? First of all, we worry about policy issues. So we talk to Congress, we talk to federal agencies, we urge them to focus on computing research and fund computing research. We educate them to the importance of computing research for the nation's economic future, for the nation's security, for their ability to do their job, whether they're NIH or NASA or any other um, branch of the federal government, agency of the federal government. So our first area that we work in is policy, which boiled down to it means money for you to do good research and programs for you to do good research in. We also work in information gathering. So a lot of people know of CRA because every year when they report the number of students in computer science, those are our numbers that we've collected. But perhaps more relevant to you all is we also collect uh, salary data. So we know, for example, how much beginning assistant professors make. And so when it's time for you to go look for a job, let's say as a beginning assistant professor, be sure to consult our salary data so you know what kind of salary you ought to be making. And don't let the university pay you a dime less. We work in community. So we bring various computing researchers together in various forms. Uh, this is one of them. You may have noticed that we have a whole collection of you here from year one and year two. Uh, people who didn't necessarily know each other. We're building a community of CI fellows. We hope that you'll stay in contact, that you'll work together, or at least that when you see each other in a conference down the road, you'll say, ah, I know someone at this conference, and you'll be able to go up and say hello. We have some other activities that way. Um, we do a snowbird conference, which some of you have attended, and I hope ultimately all of you will attend every other year for the leadership of the computing research enterprise. And lastly, we work in the area of human resources. You can't do a lot of computing research without computing researchers. So we work through a number of programs to encourage students to get degrees in the computing fields, to go on and get their PhDs in the computing fields, and then to have a successful career as a researcher. Whether it's in academia or in industry, we want people to have successful careers. So every other year, CRA puts on a career mentoring workshop, which brings together primarily brand new assistant professors to a workshop in February. You think the weather's bad in DC now, you should see it at the end of February. And we talk about how to get your career going, how to get your research going, how to get uh, funding for your proposals, um, how to get your teaching going if you're an academic, importantly, how to balance all of this with having a life, having a family. And we did this last year, and because we had the CI fellows, we invited all of them to the workshop. And the reason we're doing it now is because they told us how valuable that was, but that it really would have been even more valuable if we had done it earlier. So we weren't planning to have one of these at all this year. But because of what they told us, we decided to create a career mentoring workshop for the new crop of CI fellows, and we're holding it in December to have it a little bit earlier in the year. So that's the sort of thing we do for human resources. 
I urge you to take a look at our website, cra.org, and look at a vast array of programs that we do. Um, you might even see my photo pop up on the website. Um, vast array of programs. Um, so know that we are a membership organization, but it's institutional members, not individuals. So I'm not up here hitting you to join. You can't join. Uh, virtually all of your institutions are already members, um, but you don't have to be at a member institution to participate. Um, so pay attention to what goes on there. If you're interested in policy issues, we have a blog. We have a number of other activities going on um, that I hope you will take advantage of. Uh, one of those activities is an organization, an entity called the Computing Community Consortium. We did not pick the name. That was picked by the National Science Foundation who funds it. And this effort is really all about visioning the future, particularly computing research, which will change the future. And Sue Graham, who is right here in the second table in the middle, and will be talking to you tomorrow, is co-chair of that effort. So feel free to ask her more about it, or ask me more about it, I'll be happy to tell you. But underneath that effort is the CI Fellows Program. So the CI Fellows Program was envisioned to help people who were at the top of the class in terms of their computing research uh, credentials and potential stay in the game in incredibly difficult economic times. So that's how it got started. The person who, actually I'm going to do a little time out in a tangent here. I'm supposed to tell you about the Wi-Fi. And I don't want to forget, because that's important. When you're in your hotel room, we are paying for your Wi-Fi. It's part of the rate. But apparently their software doesn't know that. So just accept it. Where it says, do you accept that you'll pay for this Wi-Fi? Just say yes. And they're supposed to take it off your bill when you leave. If they haven't taken it off your bill, tell them that you're part of the CI Fellow, CRA, CCC workshop, and they're supposed to take it off. If they still won't take it off, pay for it, we'll reimburse you for it anyway, and then we'll get it back from the hotel. So that's how you get Wi-Fi in your room. It's free to you. Um, and breakfast will be at about 7.30 outside this room, and then the meeting room will be here at 8.30. Now back to CI Fellows. Um, so tonight we have as our uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Peter Lee. So he has a very distinguished bio, which is I printed up here. Um, he's at Microsoft Research. He runs the Redmond Lab, which is the biggest lab at Microsoft. But he's just been there two months. Before that, he was at DARPA for a year as part of the renaissance at DARPA. Um, if you don't follow the CRA blog, you don't know all about the renaissance at DARPA, but it's a big, big renaissance, which may impact your careers enormously down the road, and Peter was part of that renaissance. Before that, he was head of uh, the computer science department at CMU, and he was the CRA board chair for all of two months before he bailed on us and went to DARPA. Um, but the staff still remembers him fondly because he used to come to Washington and take us out to lunch. And the CRA staff loves anyone who will take them out to lunch. Um, so there's a lot of good stories about Peter and what he's really interested in. But um, we won't go into that now. Um, and again, so there's lots of stuff in his bio. And I encourage you to read his bio so you can be impressed. But all you really need to know is that CI Fellows was Peter's idea. And so he may, and he does, say, oh, no, a lot of people had the idea, blah, blah, blah. But I'm up here telling you, I'm older than he is, and I'm telling you, and so you have to believe me, that CI Fellows was Peter's idea. He was the driving force behind discussing it with the National Science Foundation. He was the driving force behind writing the proposal that got funded. He was the driving force behind getting the reviewers together and getting the review process set up and the website set up. All of that and the review process and the selection of the awardees all the way through. So you don't need to know anything else about his bio except that you wouldn't be here if Peter hadn't done what he did. So Peter.
Wow. Um, I don't know that uh, I can really follow free Wi-Fi, but uh, <laughs> I guess that, that uh, intro uh, came as close as possible. Let's see. Let me push this button. See if this works. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I'm really thrilled to be here, and I'm uh, really thrilled to see so many of you here. I know the uh, weather was a challenge for a lot of people. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, my mind and my head has been spinning for the last few uh, months, and so it's hard to know exactly uh, what to talk about. Um, uh, Erwin, who uh, has been uh, really great to interact with at the on the CRA staff um, made a few suggestions about talking about my background and then what I did at DARPA and uh, perspectives on CI fellows. Uh, so I think I'll try to do that. Um, but uh, this is meant uh, ultimately just to start a conversation. And so uh, I'm hoping I'll leave some time for questions uh, afterwards. And I really don't know what to talk about. Uh, and so I thought maybe in the end um, I would try to count myself as a CI fellow and talk about being a CI fellow. and um, and. Maybe it'll become obvious uh, at the end of the talk why. So uh, let me talk a little bit, first of all, about, uh, about my background. Um, seem, given all the weather uh, issues, uh, first of all, to talk about where I grew up. Um, and this is a recent picture um, from about two weeks ago in Houghton, Michigan, which is way in the uh, northernmost part of Michigan. And um, this picture is impressive for its snow, because Houghton gets about 300 inches of snow per year. Um, but uh, the real point of this story, is, uh, part of the story, is that um, I grew up in a household of scientists. My dad um, ran one of the premier snow research facilities in the U.S. Um, now, the number one snow research facility is actually in Japan, not in uh, the United States, but this is in the U.S., one of the top ones, and he's a physicist, and my mom um, was a chemist, and so I grew up in a household with a very strong uh, kind of physical science uh, kind of presence and bias. Um, I got into uh, computer science uh, just by sheer luck because when I um, was growing up in this small town, this was a very, very isolated place that didn't understand people who looked a little bit different and who thought about different things. Um, and so, in fact, I ended up dropping out of high school and trying to get into college, which is a very hard thing to do. Um, I, uh, there was just by sheer luck, someone gave me a chance at the University of Michigan, so I ended up being there. And um, when I found that physics was too difficult for me, uh, I fell into the easy field of computer science. <laughs> <coughs> um, now, uh, as a computer science uh, graduate student, I really fell in love with uh, some fairly theoretical work that was instigated by two uh, people in, uh, at Oxford, England, uh, Christopher Strachey and Dana Scott. And this is Dana Scott, who was really instrumental in my early career, uh, because in sort of a shocking move uh, in the uh, mid-1980s, Dana Scott joined the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. And even at that time, Carnegie Mellon was already known as a very kind of systems uh, applied research oriented uh, place and so for someone doing European style theory to join the Carnegie Mellon faculty was um, was a really uh, uh, really made ripples and it was very important to me because um, I was following Dana's work uh, very closely and my own PhD thesis was fairly theoretical working in a branch of uh, mathematics and computer science called domain theory uh, that Dana had uh, pioneered. Um, just to give you an idea about what this is about, uh, Dana's early work really focused on some thought experiments. These are thought experiments like if you have a black box and you can put inputs on one end of the box, turn a crank, and eventually, you don't know when, but eventually some outputs will come out of the other end of the box. What can you say about what goes on in that box? And a whole uh, kind of information theory uh, came out of that research. Uh, to put it in more computer science terms, uh, Dana would ask questions like this. Uh, let's take a look at this uh, statement on this slide. And all of us here as computer scientists, we can read this as a computer program. But remember, Dana was doing mathematics, and so he read this as a mathematical formula, where the name of the game, just like you would do in algebra, is to solve for f. Okay, so what is the solution for f? 
Now, we as computer scientists very easily and naturally say, well, we know that God has created the factorial function, okay? <laughs> and so the solution to this equation is that God's factorial function is it. If we put the factorial function in on both sides of this equation, substitute for f, the equation holds and we're done. But Dana found that this was not a good answer because yes, while this solution works for that equation, that solution also works for this equation. So I'll let you read that for just a moment. And we know as computer scientists that when we read that equation, it's not a program, it's an infinite loop. And so somehow it's mathematically inconsistent. There's some inconsistency between normal, say, set theory and computable structures. And out of this type of thought experiment, a whole new mathematical theory, uh, actually several mathematical theories, but initially domain theory uh, arose. And this was a very, very early work um, by uh, Chris and uh, Dana. And I found this just exciting and beautiful beyond belief. Um, first of all, you know, I didn't want to fall completely out of the respectable disciplines like physics and chemistry, so mathematics was a good, uh, uh, a good alternative. And so this is certainly really hard, brand new mathematics. But even for computer science, this looked like proof to me that computer science was actually something new. It wasn't just a tool that physicists and chemists used, that there was something much deeper intellectually going on in the field that was really completely respectful intellectually. And, and so I really became a computer scientist. And after finishing my undergraduate degree, I continued my PhD studies in computer science uh, because of this. Now, um, uh, when I, uh, one of the things I like to brag about is I, you know, when I had dropped out of high school, I couldn't get into Carnegie Mellon, although I tried. Um, after I finished my undergraduate degree, I applied to Carnegie Mellon for graduate studies, and I did not get admitted. Um, but after I finished my graduate studies, also at Michigan, in the area of denotational semantics, finally Dana Scott uh, agreed to hire me uh, at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, and so I went to Carnegie Mellon. Now, uh, even though Carnegie Mellon had Dana Scott, uh, remember we're living in the United States, and this type of theoretical computer science wasn't really that well understood or accepted. Um, none of the other top departments were doing this kind of work. Uh, at that time, um, and I immediately found uh, that I was always challenged. My fundamental belief system was that this was good research because it was just that beautiful. It's almost like a crystalline structure that's just it's so beautiful that if it, this isn't the right way to think about computing, then that's the cruelest hoax that God could have played on us. Now, I'm not that religious, by the way, so, but the, uh, so, um, but, Typical computer scientists uh, didn't think that way at the time, and many today even still don't. Maybe some of you don't, but, but I do. Um, it was challenging. Uh, I remember as an assistant professor, before I had tenure, uh, that my department head uh, was arguing with me, Peter, why are you wasting your career and your time working on this stuff? Uh, and at one point he said, Peter, if you think that beauty is so important in your research, maybe you should join the School of Art uh, and, and not be in our department. And those were uh, tough things uh, to, to take. And one of the themes that I want to convey here is that at that moment when I didn't actually feel like I was an independent researcher, that I didn't have the autonomy to pursue research as I saw fit, uh, that was a moment when a little bit of me started to wilt. Okay, and so one of the things that I want to convey uh, in this keynote is the importance of that independence. And in fact, what we're so thrilled as a team of people involved in CI Fellows, uh, we're really always thrilled when we see that CI Fellows enables you to be a little bit more autonomous and a little bit more independent. Um, and part of that for me anyway uh, uh, comes from this early experience. 
Um, I was then uh, very, very happy as a computer science professor um, for over 20 years at, at CMU. Um, and then um, uh, uh, one of my best friends in the world, uh, Mark Camlet, um, became the provost at Carnegie Mellon. Um, really, really a great person. Um, and he asked me, after a year or two uh, being the provost, he asked me if I would be his vice provost for research. And so uh, I had been a computer science professor for 20 years, and I thought, well, maybe this is a very good friend of mine, and I should help him out. And this was my chance to see what it was like to branch out a little bit, do a little bit more research management and, um, and so on. So I uh, worked for him uh, as a vice provost for research. Now, people wonder, what is a vice provost for research? And it is a really strange job. Um, the provost actually is a powerful person because he controls large amounts of money at a university and, most importantly, controls both office space and parking. Yeah. Um, and so it's a source of uh, really, really a lot of power. Uh, and a vice provost for research, in contrast, uh, doesn't have any budget line authority at all at most universities, and that's true at, at CMU. Um, on the other hand, it was a job uh, that I really loved because um, in a strange way, not having a budget to worry about is liberating. Uh, think about your own lives already. You're already starting to get, we're, we're in fact in CIFL is starting to get you worried about budgets. Um, uh, think of a world or a job where you don't have to worry about that and where you flit about and you find good things to do for people. When you can, you do them and everyone loves you. It's very gratifying and if there are really, really hard intractable problems, well, that's what the deans and department heads are for. <laughs> um, and so it was actually one of the happiest periods of my, um, of my uh, professional life. Um, in fact, I likened being a vice provost of research to being a grandparent. And so let me just show a grandparenting picture. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's sort of like you get all the good stuff about little kids, but when it comes down to changing diapers, that's what the parents are for. And, um, and so um, I, I had a really, really great time. Now, I was just one year into being the vice provost of research, and, um, and then the National Science Foundation called, uh, not for me, but for Jeanette Wing. And that was very important because Jeanette Wing was the head of the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, she accepted. It was very, very important and very good that she did that. But that meant then that the computer science department wanted me back uh, to, be, to replace Jeanette as the head of computer science. And um, that was very difficult. I was only one year into my job for my very, very close friend, Mark Hamlet. My wife told me don't do it because she thought I was much easier to live with as a, <laughs> a vice provost. Um, but you know, my first love is really computer science. I felt like I had more research to do. Um, and I thought if I was going to try management at all, why not try being the number one person instead of the number two person? And so I uh, agreed to do that. And that period when I was the head of computer science at Carnegie Mellon was a very, very productive one for me, not just research-wise, um, because uh, a lot of papers got published and I had some great students. but. That was the time when I got much, much more heavily involved in community service. And so as Andy mentioned, um, I uh, was very active on the CRA board and uh, eventually um, became elected the board chair uh, and got to preside over one meeting. Um, uh, I also had been elected to the Computer Science and Television Communications Board of the uh, National Research Council, part of the National Academies, um, and had, had just started uh, on a project to redo what's called the tire tracks di uh, diagram. And uh, I'm sure most of you don't know what that is, but it turns out in some uh, computing policy circles that's a, it's a very important diagram and it's, in, it's sorely in need of um, updating. I also had the great fun of being on the committee to build the new Gates Center for Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. And as the department head, I got to work directly with the um, architects to design the department head suite. Um, and in fact, I got to sit in that office for two days before going to DARPA. Um, 
Um, and then I, um, I got involved in uh, starting the CI Fellows project. And all of these things, which are all wonderful things, all got started and then were all left uh, unfinished, or my participation was left before they got finished um, because of this person. And so this is Ed Lazowska, uh, and Ed, along with Sue Graham, are the co-chairs of the uh, CCC that, uh, that Andy had mentioned before. Now, what is the blame here? Um, well, um, <clears throat> this was in uh, November of 2008, and you might recall that uh, we had an election, and a new president was elected. And Ed happened to be good friends with a guy named Tom Khalil, who's now working in the White House. And uh, Tom was a, a faculty member at Berkeley. Um, and Tom asked Ed for some help on getting some two-page white papers written on what are important things for the for the new government to do in computing research. And so Tom really leaned on Ed to try to canvas and make use of the CCC and the CRA to kind of canvas the uh, community and come up with these two-page white papers. And if you go to the CRA website and go to the CCC from there, and then from there you can actually find all of these two-page white papers. And they're really, really good to read. And of course, none of them are two pages. Uh, very few people actually stuck to the page limit, but they're pretty short anyway. Um, and so um, Ed asked me to write a two-page white paper on what to do about DARPA. Um, because DARPA, for old-timers like me and Ed and Sue, was one of the most important federal agencies in computing research, um, going all the way back to the time when uh, the ARPANET was started. DARPA had, uh, it was called ARPA at that time, uh, uh, provided the funding uh, for that. Uh, to just huge advances and very, very uh, creative, imaginative, far out funding for all kinds of ideas in VLSI design, um, in software development and engineering, um, just you name it. And DARPA, DARPA's imprint has, is, has been there. And throughout the Silicon Valley, you could argue um, very, very forcefully that the Silicon Valley boom would not have happened without DARPA. After 9-11 and the wars started, DARPA, like the rest of the DOD, was directed or redirected to focus all attention on supporting the war effort. And in that process, DARPA shifted its focus away from the academic and basic research community to the defense community, um, with a corresponding shift away from university uh, research, and one of the biggest casualties in that shift uh, was a shift away from basic computer science. Computer science was not viewed as something that could you know, help detect roadside bombs or, you know, or uh, contribute to the shock and awe efforts in, in Iraq and so on. And so in the new administration, there was a strong desire to return DARPA to its roots. And so um, of these two-page white papers, I wrote uh, one of them, uh, which is uh, the, just the abstract that's shown here. Uh, and you can uh, look at this online. I wrote a uh, first couple of drafts. Uh, then I realized that I didn't know what I was talking about because I had never worked at DARPA. And so I asked uh, uh, my good colleague, Randy Katz at Berkeley, who had actually uh, been uh, a program director at, at DARPA um, to co-author with me, and Randy uh, really helped rewrite the white paper, and, and then uh, we put it out there. Now, this white paper ended up being the bane of my existence. Um, there were some people who were very critical of it, um, but most importantly, in uh, a sign that when you let your ego get the best of you, you will get punished, you notice that I put my name first uh, on this uh, white paper. Uh, instead of doing the easy thing, which is to put Randy's name first and then say it's all alphabetical. Um, and because of that, when the administration came around to putting in a new leadership team in DARPA, this kept getting thrown back in my face instead of Randy's face. And that got compounded by the fact that another very, very close friend of mine, Regina Dugan, uh, had been appointed by the president to be the new DARPA director. And so the combination of these two things 
um, just made it really impossible for me uh, to say, no, I can't serve. And so I, I was conscripted into service. And again, this was very difficult. I was only two years into being the head of the computer science department after having been only one year as the vice provost and after having gotten all these other things started. And so again, leaving all of that uh, in order to, um, uh, to uh, work for Regina Dugan. And so, uh, so then I went to DARPA. Um, incidentally, this is also yet another case where my wife was extremely unhappy. She was already unhappy about me uh, becoming the head of computer science, and now I was saying, we either have to move the whole family to Washington for a couple of years, or we're going to have a commuting uh, relationship, and we're, you know, so we had to commute. Um, strangely, my wife ended up really liking me out of the house all the time, but the, uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, that's the, uh, and my 13-year-old son seems not to care that I'm not around, so. Um, so then I was uh, one year, actually only about six months or so into my stint at DARPA. And um, those of you that know me, I'm a big fan of gadgets and, and um, coincidentally uh, Apple gadgets. And so the iPad came out and I leapt at it. I bought one and I loved it. I still love it. And I was using uh, the iPad and I started to rave about how great it was on uh, my Facebook page. And uh, one of my Facebook friends is Rick Rashid, um, who was one of the faculty members who had hired me, along with Dana, at Carnegie Mellon, um, but is now the senior vice president for research at Microsoft. And so we got into an argument on Facebook. Um, <laughs> and he, he was pretty certain that I was completely wrong-headed, and he was trying to explain to me why um, the iPad wouldn't go anywhere, and I was trying to argue, You're, you've got to use it, it's great. And that went on for a couple of days, and then the next day after that, I get a phone call from Rick asking me if I'd consider going to Microsoft to be the new director of the Redmond Lab. And so it's a very, very strange way that things twist here. Um, but the, um, again, the difficulty here is that I was only a few months into my stint at DARPA. Um, and, you know, I had promised two years, and the soldiers that I was working with uh, didn't have the flexibility to bail out on their tours of duty a year early. And so it was a very, very difficult uh, decision uh, for me. Um, and again, um, I was leaving a very, very good friend of mine in the lurch by doing this. Uh, ultimately, I had to decide uh, how to trade off an opportunity for me and my family against a temporary tour of duty uh, here. And, um, and I still wonder if I've made the right decision, but I had to make a decision, and so now I'm at Microsoft Research. Um, and so um, this is uh, Rick Rashid, who's now my new boss. And you can see behind him are the, uh, is the map of all the worldwide research labs uh, for Microsoft. Um, and the one that I'm running now is the one in the Pacific Northwest in Redmond, which is the largest, uh, having about 350 of the 850 uh, researchers um, in Microsoft Research. Now, um, I've been, uh, I use this picture because I've left a trail of wreckage with all of these one-year <laughs> stints. Um, and let me say that all of this can be blamed on Washington, D.C., um, because if it weren't for Jeanette Wing going off to Washington to run computer science at NSF, none of this would have happened. Um, and so let me, let me join the Tea Party group and, and blame it all on D.C. <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, Irwin asked me to talk a little bit about DARPA, and so I'll say a few words. Although um, there are federal laws that prevent me from saying anything in too much detail or anything that could influence uh, decisions or involve any programs that had started, so I'll have to be a little high level here. Um, and so I'll try to stay with the general theme here leading to CIA fellows and just uh, and, and talk at a very high level. Um, when I went to DARPA, my belief was that I was being called there to restart basic computer science research at, at DARPA. Um, after I had agreed, and Regina Dugan was very smart to not let on what the real mission was um, until I had agreed, uh, she told me, no, Peter, you're not starting computer science. You're starting a new office focused on technology surprise. And um, 
I really had no idea what that meant. Uh, very, very, very uncomfortable. Um, and on top of that, she said, my secondary mission is to create discomfort. Um, and I was already feeling uncomfortable, but I didn't know how to create it in other people. Um, so, uh, so this was really a very, very uh, kind of difficult uh, moment for me. And um, if you ever get a chance to meet Regina Dugan, and I hope most of you do, uh, she's a very, very powerful uh, person, just really imposing uh, personality, uh, extremely smart. She's not a computer scientist. She's a Caltech-trained um, uh, mechanical engineer, uh, PhD in mechanical engineering, uh, but very, very smart and really knows a lot. And, um, and so the discomfort here uh, was really palpable. And so I had to figure out what to do. On top of that, my stint at DARPA was supposed to start on August 17th. But on August 10th, 2009, Secretary Gates was making a visit to DARPA. And so Regina Dugan said, Peter, you have to come and spend 10 minutes with Secretary Gates and tell him what you're going to do. <laughs> OK? And so um, I really didn't know. In fact, I think she, in typical DARPA style, she told me that one or two days before the meeting. Um, now, uh, I didn't know what to do. I got in the car to drive to Washington, still not knowing what to talk about. And I arrived at DARPA not knowing um, what to talk about. Luckily, the CRA comes to the rescue again. Um, because a week or two before this, I had lunch with the CRA. And um, let's say that there is karma here again, because Andy Burnett is always trying to wangle free lunches for his staff at the CRA. <laughs> and um, I had, uh, just a couple weeks earlier, taken the whole CRA staff out to lunch. And while I was having lunch with them, I was complaining about getting speeding tickets on the drive between DC and Pittsburgh. And so Kapil Petnik and Peter Harsha whipped out their iPhones and showed me this. And this is an app called Trapster. And also runs on other phones, but um, I was using it on an iPhone at the time. And this, has been a li this was a lifesaver for me, because I had gotten a couple of um, speeding tickets, and this solved the problem. Um, and so uh, if you haven't seen Trapster, what it does is as you're driving along, um, it gives you a voice alert when you're about to encounter a speed camera, a red light camera, or a speed trap that some other Trapster user has just seen recently. And if you see one, you can tap that report button and report it. And if you get a report, it gives you a dig style thumbs up or thumbs down. So you can rate the quality of the report. And by doing that rating, you will affect the social status of the reporter. And so you create a social incentive uh, to report as well. Uh, really great, uh, a great, great thing. Um, thanks to the CRA staff. Um, so, um, not knowing what else to do, I decided to spend my 10 minutes with Secretary Gates showing him this. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> now, um, it sounds silly, but here's the, here's the spiel. Um, we have the ubiquity of mobile internet, of cloud computing, and of social networking all converging together to create a technology that completely changes the rules of the game, the standard measure-countermeasure game that I as a motorist and the Maryland State Police were playing. They would get a radar, I'd get a radar detector. they get a laser detector, I'd get a laser detector, and back and forth. A very similar game to what we play with adversaries in the military setting. But we see in the democratization of very powerful technologies and the convergence of those technologies the possibility of something really disruptive to happen. And so then the spiel ended with, I'm standing up a new technology surprise office that will explore the opportunities and the seeds of such technology disruptions. That was my 10 minutes. Not bad, huh? <laughs> so um, now the other ulterior motive here that I thought was really genius, and I really have to give credit again to the CRA staff, is that this also then gave me license to say, and that's why we do computer science. OK? Because underneath here, we have algorithms. We have uh, distributed computing. 
we have social media, we have graphics, you, we, just everything you could think of, networking, uh, is needed to all come together to support this. And so uh, this gave the foundation uh, to provide computer science as front and center um, uh, basic research for a technology surprise office. And so that's, that, that sent us on our way. So then um, I arrived at DARPA a week later. What I was going to do. And so I was feeling pretty good about really the place for us to be looking if we're really worried about technological disruptions. And so I want to show just the first three slides from that talk. And the first slide was this one. Now I showed this slide. Um, you won't remember this, only the few of us who are old enough. This is from 1969. Uh, this is Neil Armstrong, uh, first man on the moon. And um, this was really important to me. I, I was just a nine-year-old kid. Uh, this made me want to be a scientist. Uh, I think it, this happened to a lot of people. For DARPA, this was really important because DARPA, uh, 40 year, this is the 40th anniversary, and when I was at DARPA, it was the 40th anniversary of this event, and DARPA order number one was for the rocket technology that went into the Saturn V booster that enabled um, men uh, to escape Earth orbit and get to the moon. And just a huge scientific accomplishment in the summer of 2009. Uh, something like 65,000 people all organized working together for the single purpose of putting this man on the moon and bringing him back. Now, at the same year, again in 1969, the first two nodes of the ARPANET between Stanford Research Institute and UCLA uh, were connected, and there was the attempt to send the, the string login from UCLA to Stanford Research Institute, which failed after the letters L and O made it. And then there was a buffer overflow, the first buffer overflow on the ARPANET. Um, and then later that year, in December of that year, the first four nodes of the ARPANET were strung together. Um, and when that happened, there was what the SRI people like to call the mother of all demos, where Doug Engelbart, uh, using this uh, handcrafted mouse, the first mouse, demonstrated how two people in geographically disparate parts of the world could use a network to collaborate together on a document. Okay, and so even though the ARPANET was conceived initially by ARPA as a highly resilient communications network, something that could really withstand the rigors of uh, warfare, early on, the visionaries involved in the ARPANET already were starting to understand that uh, much more human and social possibilities and collaborative possibilities were present in the ARPANET. So then what I did is I asked the staff, which one of these two events, these two monumental events that we're celebrating, for which we're celebrating the 40th anniversary and for which ARPA had a prime involvement, which one had more impact? Now, it's a silly question because of the, uh, of course, they're both hugely impactful and it's hard to compare these things, but for the rhetorical purposes of my talk, I answer this question uh, by showing this. Um, and this is an old picture of one of Pat Lincoln's uh, daughters. And, um, and my joke about this is that my son has never used Saturn V technology to reinforce his school lessons. Um, he hasn't used lunar landing docking technology to download porn behind my back. Um, <laughs> none of those things have happened out of that. But the fact that we have this tremendous democratization potential with the ARPANET, the fact that there was a potential for costs to go down exponentially and availability to go up exponentially, leads to the possibility of democratization of something very powerful. And when you have something very powerful, that is so widely available, consistently we find through history uh, that surprising disruptions occur. And so one of the organizing principles here is to say that computing is still full of the potential uh, for technology democratization. 
and therefore computing research for a technology surprise office and for a technology surprise agency like DARPA uh, is of fundamental importance. And in fact, this wasn't just rhetoric. I really believe that there is no other discipline today, no other intellectual endeavor that is more exciting than computing and computing research if what you care about is, uh, is really inventing something so new that it completely shifts everyone's worldview. And so we're all incredibly lucky to be involved in this field. And so uh, that, this was the lesson about disruptive uh, effects of technology democratization. Now I started off, um, I still, even though I think I was on a roll, I still hadn't won uh, very much funding for uh, a tech office. I uh, had just uh, a little bit of funding, and so I had to think of something to do. And uh, the first thing we did on the 40th anniversary of the first four nodes of the ARPANET was we staged a contest uh, called the DARPA Network Challenge, where we uh, hid 10 eight-foot red weather balloons in the United States. Uh, they were held aloft, about 100 feet in the air, tethered to the ground. And for eight hours on December 5th, they were up, and we said, whoever can report uh, the latitude and longitude of these 10 balloons um, would get a $40,000 prize in commemoration of the 40th anniversary, anniversary of the ARPANET. Um, about 4,400 teams from around the world ended up um, uh, competing in this. And this was a great experiment in the diffusion of information through the internet and through social networks. Um, it ended up creating a lot of inventive ideas. Uh, interestingly, there were teams from all over the world that competed, including teams even from Iran, the Sudan, from China, from Russia. Um, and it, importantly, for military purposes, created a highly adversarial environment where teams had incentives to keep secrets, to throw up decoys, to lie, to infiltrate each other's um, teams. Um, one of the Russian teams even hacked the DARPA uh, website hosting this service put a virus that if it infected your computer would secretly uh, redirect your computer to a spoof website for reporting balloon sightings that they were running. Uh, really a beautiful thing. And so this was a way again to demonstrate um, the disruptive potential of, of computing um, and other agencies like the United Nations now are using some of the techniques that were discovered by this experiment, for example, the United Nations uh, One Billion Hungry uh, Drive uh, uses a social uh, incentive program that's modeled after the MIT Recursive Incentive Scheme. All right, so now um, I wanted to say a little bit more about um, how I fit this into the DARPA context and uh, more about technological surprise. And so I'm going to give you a test that Regina Dugan was giving to a bunch of uh, senior leaders in Congress and in the Defense Department. And if you've seen this test, please don't ruin it for everyone else. Um, in, interestingly, I've been using the same test on product group presidents and the uh, Microsoft CEO. So I'm about to show you a picture, and there'll be a bunch of dots. And what I want you to do, you'll have five seconds to count the number of red dots, okay? So here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. All right, so how many blue dots were there? Now, um, this is kind of a silly uh, old uh, question, um, but the point here is uh, in the military, as well as in the product groups at Microsoft, uh, most of the people have to be very focused. They have to be very focused on the mission at hand. So if that's counting red dots, they cannot be distracted or stray, stray away from that. If it's delivering Connect in time for the Christmas holiday season, that's the absolute focus. Um, and so people who are very mission-oriented have that kind of focus, and it's necessary, and the discipline that's required is tremendous. We as researchers, we're liberated from that. And in fact, it's our job not to do that, but to wonder about what else is in that picture, to understand whether there are other shapes, uh, other colors, why they're there, uh, and so on. And so a thing to understand is that as researchers, 
we have a very different purpose in life than almost everyone else in society. And that difference is very hard to understand. And Regina Dugan used this picture to try to, to, try to find some way to convey that. Basic research is something that is just incredibly important and is incredibly underappreciated right now, really everywhere. The uh, official definition from the National Science Foundation uh, says it's the original investigation for the advancement of knowledge which does not necessarily have immediate commercial objectives. So you can read does not have immediate commercial objectives but somehow it doesn't get across uh, and uh, with the kind of impact that the red dots, blue dots test does. And so what we do, again, is very different and hard to understand. So difficult and hard to understand that I find that even researchers forget why is basic research important. And so one of the things that I hope all of you, with your newfound independence and the opportunities you're given through CI fellows, is that you always keep in mind and you become ambassadors for the importance of basic research. Even your colleagues, uh, where you're being mentored, uh, might not fully grasp it anymore. At Microsoft, this is a continual struggle. I'm only there for two months. I've only been there for two months. But it's hard even for people in the product groups to forget that underneath these kinds of new products and technologies are decades of basic research on basic uh, concepts. If you look at Connect, just at Microsoft Research alone, there's more than a decade of computer vision and um, audio and speech processing research. And that builds on decades of research in the broader research community. And so um, really understanding this so that we're ready uh, when there are big opportunities is, is incredibly important. Uh, let me give you a second story that I've been telling, um, uh, which also pertains to the, our role as researchers. Um, and I don't know if this is true. People tell me conflicting things, that this is just a, a, a story, and some people say, no, this is a real experiment. Um, but this is the five monkeys in a cage experiment. And so what is this? So you put five monkeys in a cage, and outside the cage is a very, very strong, cold water jet. And then you have a, uh, s some bananas on top of a ladder. So after a little while, one of the monkeys figures out that you can climb the ladder to get the bananas. And the cage is rigged so that if any monkey steps on the first rung of that ladder, the water jet turns on full blast and just knocks every uh, monkey down. Okay? So this happens over and over again, and eventually all five monkeys become trained never to touch the ladder. Okay? So now you take one of those monkeys, trained monkeys out, and you put an untrained monkey into the cage. After a little while, that untrained monkey looks up at the uh, bananas, says, oh, I can get those, steps on the ladder, and what happens? Well, we've put the hose away already, but the other four trained monkeys rush and tackle uh, that untrained monkey. Okay, so monkeys are pretty smart. And uh, this happens over and over again. Eventually, that untrained monkey becomes trained. Then you take another trained monkey, replace it, the same thing happens. Eventually, you replace all five monkeys. And all five monkeys now are pristine in the sense that they've never been squirted by water, uh, but none will touch the ladder. And so this is a way of saying that in organizations and in societies, we develop, for completely rational reasons, ways of thinking, ways of doing things, and models of the world or worldviews. We develop paradigms, and we know that the, those things work. But that oftentimes doesn't account for changes in the external environment. And so another purpose that we have as researchers is to somehow maintain the independence of thought to be the person who thinks, well, maybe things have changed, or to look outside the cage and wonder, hey, I don't see a hose anymore. Uh, and be able to risk the failure and tolerate that failure in case you know, there is still a hose somewhere and you just didn't see it, but to try again. And so this leads to a lot of research values. We do a lot of things. We keep asking questions. And we ask those questions very openly, not just to ourselves, but in a way that is hopefully as challenging to as many people, including ourselves, as possible. 
We fight the non-invented here syndrome as much as possible. We tolerate failure, encourage taking bigger risks, and you as researchers are put up on pedestals as the font of all wisdom and knowledge, not managers and bosses, but, but researchers. And all of these are fundamental research values that again make us as researchers very different from the rest of society and the rest of the world. And so again, these are very important things uh, for us to remember and to hang on to. So you are all now the new monkeys uh, in CAGE, um, and so am I uh, at Microsoft, and uh, this is part of what we have to do. And this means also as a corollary that if in your research you're not failing occasionally, um, I know you're all smart, uh, so that probably means you're not thinking big enough. And so you have to be also personally willing uh, to take on some risks and to have a few sleepless nights uh, on things um, in order to go for something big. Um, now, uh, I wanted to say a few more words about open-mindedness. Um, so I was talking about independence and about failure. Uh, now a few more words about um, open-mindedness, and then I'll stop for questions. When I was at DARPA, I learned a lot, but the most important thing I learned was not from any of the senior leaders at DARPA or any of the congressional committees or um, uh, any of the four stars, but from um, a guy named Mudge, Peter Zatko. And those of you that work in computer security uh, know this guy is fairly notorious. Um, and um, in a strange move, DARPA hired him as a program manager, which I thought was great. Um, and he uh, drew for me this diagram, which is a taxonomy of research motivations. On the x-axis, we have research that on the left-hand side uh, is designed to have a, be relevant in the shorter term, low risk, uh, versus research that's very high risk and speculative. And maybe we need more patients to see them pan out. On the y-axis, we have research which uh, near the origin is reactive, known problems. Um, and we're trying to address those problems uh, versus uh, research that is trying to really uh, be inventive and, um, and change the world in some, in some uh, way. And so now if we quadrantize this, we get different lanes of research. And the wording here I changed to be wording relevant to Microsoft, but you can probably map them onto your own, uh, your own um, uh, situations as well. On the lower left, we have what you could call mission focused. So within Microsoft, um, you know, fighting the holy war against Google in the search area, um, you know, is down there. Okay, that's something we is absolutely absolutely crucial. It requires really really deep knowledge of machine learning and and statistics and so on. Uh, on the upper right is just pure blue sky curiosity driven research, really just pushing the frontiers of knowledge. I also put all of the hard, necessary uh, work in the community that we all have uh, as scholars to make sure that the academic literature, the scholarly literature is fully fleshed out and fully archived, that all of our knowledge is somehow written down and preserved. And then in the upper left is this very attractive corner of, of uh, disruptions, things that will change the world and change the world in ways that we know today. And here, um, lots of wacky uh, kinds of ideas can take place. Within Microsoft, the whole uh, push in Microsoft and Microsoft research to develop the Connect um, was really uh, in that upper left uh, quadrant. And then in the lower right um, is um, what we call sustaining kinds of research. And here, um, these are more operational kinds of issues. Um, in Microsoft Research, for example, we do a lot of work on always, every day, improving the speech recognition. And so it's not disruptive to do that, but we know it can get better and better, and so we keep making it a little bit better every day. And so these are our lanes of research, and I highlighted three of them because those are the three lanes that really, I think for us as basic researchers, deserve the most attention. And in fact, I now believe that in basic research, these three blue lanes all deserve equal emphasis and attention from us. And we all, as researchers, ought to be completely open-mindedness to the value of research in all three lanes. And so we must all be open-minded to advancing uh, the field in all of these lanes. And 
uh, beautifully in computer science, we are highly relevant in, in all of these quadrants. Finally, um, Irvin asked me to say a little about CI Fellows, but um, I actually don't want to say too much about it. Um, I will say that um, it really was not just me. Um, the idea really was floating around. Several people had it. Um, and um, the only role I think I had to get a, the ball rolling is I made a call to a really visionary person who is no longer at NSF now, Deborah Crawford, Deb Crawford. And, um, and she, I think, is one of the real unsung heroes in, in all of this because she was just very encouraging uh, from, from the beginning. Um, and the, as Andy mentioned, the CCC, CRA, and NSF are all absolutely crucial in all of this. The third bullet, though, is the one that I, I want to emphasize here, and I hope I've emphasized in my talk here, um, that our hope is that not only do we bridge a difficult period economically uh, for our research institutions um, by keeping you all in the research game, but that you become very highly, through this very highly independent start in computing research, that you maintain this independence moving forward and that you really chart new directions in computing research. And we have very early signs that many of you are successful in doing that and, and that's just incredibly exciting. So let me close uh, just with uh, some obligations. So don't just be the next monkey. Especially with CI fellows, you have now the independence to not just be a slave to your mentor, but to have your own mind, to think your own thoughts, to question things. So take advantage of that. It's important for the whole field. Keep in mind uh, what basic research is about and be a champion and be open-minded about that. Remember, society doesn't have a reason or a need to understand this on its own. It's up to us to help society understand the, the value of basic research. And then finally, uh, be great at what you do. So thanks for listening, and thanks for having me here. So I don't know if there are any questions at all. They don't have to be. Um, but if there are, I'm happy to take any. Yes? Yeah, um, so the question was about uh, people. Um, so the, um, it, you know, I've wondered about that myself um, because the, um, you can probably get a sense from the talk that I'm a real pushover. When someone asks me to do something, it's hard for me to say no. <laughs> the, um, uh, but um, let me say why I think it's a complicated question, a very good question. Um, academia and really good research labs are nothing if not havens for social misfits. Um, and so we all know that this is true, and we all know that um, there is something that creates social misfits out of the absolute dedication to some really deep research problem. Um, and as I look at and meet uh, you here uh, in events like this, well, I don't see a lot of social misfits. You're all very polished, and in fact, I'd love to have beers with all of you. You're all great, and I think I'm the same way, and that's all really good. But it's a little puzzling to me uh, that the field has become this, this way. And so um, I do sometimes wonder if somehow we've been winnowing away really, really important basic researchers uh, because of uh, lack of being able to really listen and interact importantly with other people. Having said that, um, all of the most important things in my life I have definitely learned through a face-to-face -face interaction, oftentimes sustained interaction with someone. And the people that I've mentioned there are all people that I've grown very, very close to. They aren't people that I've just met in a course, they were lecturing to me or I met in a couple of meetings, but people with whom I developed a really intimate relationship over a long period of time. And so there is something in that kind of mind meld that I have found important. 
And so I think the only truth I could draw out of that is that there is something to sustained engagement uh, with somebody and with some ideas and some person. And, um, and so the people that I've mentioned there are, are all like that. So uh, I wish I had something more definite, but it, it's something that I actually wonder about a lot. Yeah. Yes, here. So, oh, sorry. So, yeah, thank, that was a great, great talk. Um, <clears throat> you seem to have a very short job cycle in the past few years. So I was wondering, after I finish my fellowship, uh, where are you going to be next that I should <laughs> apply to? Yeah, um, it's, I actually, um, just to be honest, I actually worry that, um, gee, this, this looks really bad on my record. <laughs> the, um, um, so it, it's been uh, uh, personally difficult because um, you know, Andy laughed about it, but I really did leave him in the lurch. You know, it's not good when the board chair holds one meeting and then says, well, the government, I'm taking this government job and the government is... Uh, <laughs> um, but that's just one example of that trail of wreckage. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm hoping I'm, I can settle in for the long haul here. Um, it's hard to uh, predict the future. Maybe one thing I will say career-wise for all of you is, um, and I don't I kind of knew this rationally, but I didn't really understand it um, viscerally until now. If you are an interesting person who appears to other people to be movable, then your value in the world, fairly or unfairly, goes up tremendously. And um, so I've been either victimized or rewarded for that. <laughs> and um, and so, so just, Publicly now, I'd like to say I'm not movable, and, uh, <laughs> and so I'm hoping to be at Microsoft Research for a while. All right. Um, well, um, I'm happy to hang around and mingle, and I'll be around for at least part of the morning tomorrow. So uh, thank you all, and uh, it's really a real pleasure and honor to be here. Thanks. <laughs>